chapter 5. Um, I hope you got some notes today. Hopefully it'll help you follow along. And uh, um, There will be some preaching this afternoon or this morning, but we'll, we'll do a little more teaching than we typically do on a Sunday morning. And um, I, I've entitled the message, <clears throat> The Fight of Our Lives. The Fight of Our Lives. You ever heard someone make that statement, this is, this is a fight for my life? And uh, you ever known someone that had to fight for their life? Well, the consequence of losing the fight was death. Um, and the consequence of winning was life. And uh, we really do, and I'm not being, you know, it's not hyperbole here. It's, we really are in a fight for our lives spiritually. Uh, we've gotten uh, through this portion all the way through here to Galatians chapter 5, and Paul has just done a, a, a magnificent job. Uh, as, as I think Luther described it, he said, this is the Magna Carta of Christianity, the declaration of freedom, of liberty. Uh, and, um, and so Paul has taken, and he, uh, from practical experience, from a, a theological background, and now, right, he's saying, okay, what do we do with this liberty? What do we do with the fact that the acceptance we have with God is not, is not based on me keeping the law? The acceptance I have with God is not based on the works that I do. It's not me trying to find favor with God through my efforts. I don't relate with God any longer through the law. And praise God for that. The law was weak because of our flesh. It was unable Right? If you could be perfectly holy in word, in thought, in deed, and in attitude, then the law, I was reading this morning out of Romans chapter 7, the law is good. The law would lead you to a holy life. It is really God's standard of holiness conveyed to us. But because we are weak, because we are flesh, it is impossible. Uh, go to Romans chapter 7. Keep your finger there in Galatians 5. Um, Romans chapter 7, there's some debate on whether or not Paul is describing uh, life prior to salvation or life as a saved person. I lean, I lean towards Paul is describing the struggle he faces as a, as a believer. In Romans chapter 7, and because I think the, you see the tense change, he talks, uh, he's talking a lot about the past uh, up until verse number 14, Right? He says, for we know that the law is spiritual, right? That if we could, if we didn't have this weakness we know is our flesh, we could keep the law and in it relate to God. We could find holiness through the keeping of the law. But, <laughs> Paul writes, he says, I am carnal, sold under sin. The law is good. Uh, the, the law is life. But the problem is, is we are fleshly. We are fleshly. And Paul then goes on to describe, we'll look at it here in a minute. He goes on to describe the battle, the struggle. He describes it as a war here in Romans chapter 7. Let's go back to our text in Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to look at verse number 16 this morning. Galatians 5 verse 16. The scripture says... This I say then, all right? So knowing and remembering everything I've said, that we are no longer under bondage, the, the, the captivity of the law. We're no longer, right, uh, uh, in this struggle, right? We have been set free from the law. We have been set free from sin. We have been set free from hell, from death. Uh, uh, and we have been made free, as he describes it in chapter 5, verse 1. He says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, what was happening in the Galatian churches? Somebody help me out. Andrew. Right. right. They'd come along, these Judaizers, as they're described, right, had come along and said, listen, you really want to find full favor with God? You really want to be really all that God has called you to be? Then you've got to keep these traditions. You've got to keep these laws. And they went beyond the law. In fact, I, I think you even see them, right, saying you've got to keep all the festivals and feasts and, and, and many of the oral traditions. And, and, and what that did is it brought the Galatian believers into bondage. Whereas Christ has made them free. And he says, don't be entangled again with that yoke of bondage. You are free in Christ. And that freedom came how? Let's go to Galatians chapter 2. 
just in the way of review. Galatians chapter 2. Right, he rebukes Peter. Peter, right, uh, his acceptance of the, the Galatian believers, uh, or rather the believers in Antioch, was not on the basis of who Christ is and their relationship with Christ, but rather upon them keeping the dietary laws, the Jewish dietary laws. And Paul rebukes Peter. He says, you are not living the truth of the gospel. Well, what is the truth of the gospel then? It is that we have acceptance with God through Jesus Christ. Man, isn't that a blessing? We are accepted with God because of Jesus Christ. And then Paul says this, verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified, made righteous, made right with God by the works of the law. But how are we made right with God? How do we receive the righteousness of Christ? But by the what? Read it with me, verse 16. But by the... Oh, y'all can do better than that. Are you all awake this morning? Everybody seems a little tired this morning, all right? I haven't cranked it down to 64, so it wouldn't be too hot in here, all right? Let's try that again. Let's go to chapter 2. Let's look at verse 16. I'm going to need you to, to participate with me. All right, let's look what it says. Let's read it together. Ready? Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be made justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Romans 5 describes this process of justification in that our sin, all of our sin, was placed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that His righteousness was then placed upon us the moment we, by faith, believed in Him. And Paul says in verse 20, he says, this is the state as a believer that I'm in. He says, I am crucified with Christ. When He died, I died. His death is my death. He says, goes on, he says, uh, nevertheless what? I live. Not only did I die with him, not only did I, was I crucified with him, but now I live with him. He rose, I arose to walk in newness of life. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Faith in God's promises, that God's belief in his Son makes me right with him. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so we've been made free. Our relationship with God is not predicated on how well we keep the law. But on the very fact that Christ died for us and we've believed the promise and by faith we've believed. And that he has made us a child. We are children of the most high God if you're saved today. If you're not saved, my friend, you're not his child. He wants you to be his child. He wants to bring you into the family, but he will not force you. He will not drag you along and say, you're going to be my child whether you like it or not. No, God, in fact, presents you a choice. Will you receive me? John 1.12 says, for as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the what? Sons of God. There's a receiving that takes place, a choice that is made, right, to believe the promise of God. We read it this morning in Romans 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the what? Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be what? Saved. It's as simple as that. Man, that ought to just gladden your heart. It ought to, you ought to walk out of here skipping today. That's all it took. It ought to humble you as well. Because I don't know about you, if I really dwell on how much of a sinner I am, it can be very depressing. But yet he loved me. And while I was yet a sinner, he died for me. Just think how egregious it is for someone to know this great truth and to reject it. That's why there will be no one that stands guiltless before God. And so we come to our text in Galatians chapter 5, and Paul is saying, don't go back. Don't turn back into bondage. Don't go back to believing that what you do and the laws that you keep are, are bringing you into more favor with God. Your acceptance is based on Christ. You are, you are set free. And he goes on, he says in 
We looked a couple weeks ago. Boy, what a challenge. I don't know if you're like this, um, you that have ever preached. Do you ever preach a message and then the Lord's like, okay, let's see if you actually mean it. Right? Brother Zach's told me those stories, right? He'll go to the Cedar Point there and the Lord, he'll say, preach something. And the Lord's like, okay, let's, let's see if you're, you're actually just a hypocrite or it's for real. James 1, amen. Right? Are you going to count it all joy there, brother? Amen. I, I tell you, this, the sermon from two weeks ago, that's what the Lord did. At least in my life, my wife's life. Verse 14, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Multiple times over the last couple weeks, the Lord is like, okay, do you believe it? Here's opportunity. Do you believe it? But I'm thankful. I'm thankful for preaching. I'm thankful for the word because guess what? As the Holy Spirit brought to my mind these things, I'm like, well, Lord, you're right. May I give me the grace to yield to you in this. In verse 15, he says, but if you bite and devour one another, what's going to happen? Right? If you choose to not yield to the spirit, if you choose not to use your freedom to serve and love one another, what's going to take place? You're just going to end up devouring one another. Faith Baptist Church, I want to challenge you on something. Before I get into the message, I'm not even there yet. If we descend into this fleshly, carnal spirit, we're going to talk about the works of the flesh next week. It really, unless we repent, it really does spell the end of our church. There's anything that God is doing to be used by God. And I'm, I'm, I want you to challenge yourself in this. You know what? Verse 14. You say, I'm a great Christian. Are you? Pure religion undefiled is this, the visit of the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and keep yourself unspotted from the world, James chapter 1. Really, what, what God has called us to be and called us to do is to be a channel and a vessel of his love, beginning with one another, beginning in our homes. You say, Pastor, how is that even possible? Well, then Paul describes it here. Let's look at verse 16. Because that is what God calls us to do, because that's what God expects of us, and in yielding to his spirit, we'll produce the nine aspects of the fruit. He says, this I say then, do this, walk in the spirit. Now, we're going to put that at the end of the message, because I want to I bring us to that place. But he says, walk in the spirit and, and what? And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are what? Not under the law. So the fight is on. And it's a fight to the death. Number one, let's consider this. What are the stakes in the fight? It is literally life or death. Now, a lot of times, I believe that's exaggerated. But I, I believe, with because the scripture tells us that whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And that which is of the flesh ends up corrupting. Let's go to Galatians chapter 6. We find here, right, the Apostle Paul. We'll get to this here in a few weeks. But in verse number 7, he says, be not deceived. Don't lie to yourself. God is not mocked. All right? You can't flaunt the principles that God has put forth and expect to get away with it. God will not be mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And there's this pre prevailing thinking today, right? I've I heard it described this way. Uh, you can choose what you do, but you can't choose the consequences. And you can choose to, right, reject the leading and the, the spirit of God in your life and, and live according to your flesh, but understand the consequence of that. Look at verse number 8. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap what? Corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Keep your finger. We're going to be bouncing between Romans and Galatians. Um, really, Romans is Paul taking 
many of the ideas and thoughts in the book of Galatians and expanding on them, writing to a church that he had not yet visited. Right? He's giving them a, a, a great treatise on the, 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 the blessed truths we find in Galatians. But, but look at chapter 8 and verse number 6. He says, for to be carnally minded, actually go there, I want you to read it with me because I want to make sure we're, we're, we're staying together on this because it's so vital. For to be, let's say it together, ready? For to be carnally minded is death. Let's read that one more time because I think we have to understand what is being said. For to be carnally minded is death, but on the other side, but to be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace. It literally is a matter of life and death. Even going unto physical death. How many people do you know, right, live for themselves and have gotten so captivated and in bondage to their flesh, it actually leads to their physical death? They drink themselves to death. They drug themselves to death, right? You have seen it. But death goes beyond that, right? We see a spiritual death that took place in the garden. And beginning, the beginning of physical death for Adam and Eve. I believe relationships, the death of relationships is when you walk in the flesh. The death to, right, uh, 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 many different things. And we could go and look at all the facets. But the fight that we are engaged in as believers is a fight of life or death. God wants us to experience life. He wants us to have the abundant life. The life that is like uh, the, uh, blessings and joy and peace that just... Man, just the, it's like the waves of ocean just keeps coming and coming and coming. And not, not like uh, some of the preachers describe it in a prosperity sort of way. I love this. I, I saw a, a, a quote the other day. Uh, the mark of God's blessing in the Old Testament was prosperity, at least it seems. Right? Look at David. Look at Solomon. Look at Abraham. Very prosperous men. What's the mark of God's favor in the New Testament? Trials. <laughs> trials. Right? God allows these difficulties, these trials in our life because it fashions us into the image of who? Christ. That's why we have Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And then he goes on to talk about, right? For them he did foreknow, them he did call and predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that's what's good. That's what is success. That I am, right, more and more fashioned into the image of Christ. And what, are the, what is one of the main tools God uses to do that? Trials. The trying of your faith worketh what? Patience. But let patience have her perfect work. That you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Complete. Let God's work, these temptations, these trials, let them take place. And that's why we should count it all joy. God. You're putting me through this because you want me to be more like Jesus. And nothing, nothing that happens in my life is outside of your control. Nothing that takes place in my life as a Christian is, oh, God is in heaven saying, oh my, I can't believe that happened. It's not that way at all. And when we consider this is a life and God wants us to have life. He wants us to have the abundant life. He wants us to have a life that pleases him, that's reflective of his son, that shines as a light in this world. So it is a struggle of life and death. See, that's the stakes. Yielding to your flesh is not just a matter of, well, everybody makes mistakes. No one's perfect. We've got to wash our minds of that attitude, believer. We've got to realize that the consequence of yielding to the flesh, of allowing those fleshly lusts and desires to, to, to take and to have their way in my life, is number one, it leads me back into captivity and bondage. Just like the keeping the law would. But number two, it leads to death. Lord, I, I'm, I'm not able to experience the life you've called me to. So who are the key opponents? I think you can get this one. Who is the first key opponent? Help me. Starts with an F, ends with an H. Ah, flesh. Let's talk a little bit about the flesh this morning. It comes from the Greek word sarx, and, and, and the word itself can mean a variety of different things, specifically relating to the body, the physical body, all right? But when you, I, I was doing a little study on the word, when it is used in relation to God or to the spirit, in contrast, 
it is not just the body, the physical body. It is this. Uh, it is a mere, the mere human nature, the, uh, one writer puts it this way, mere human nature, the earthly nature of man apart from divine influence and therefore prone to sin and opposed to God. It's that part of us, another writer puts it this, the sin-desiring aspect of our whole being as opposed to the God-desiring aspect. Another writer puts it this way, uh, uh, in the New Testament it's used to denote how even our most charitable and best desires are stained and tainted by underlying sinful ones. It could also be viewed this way, any mindset, action, and attitude that is not led by the Spirit. So let's go to our text. He says, walk in the spirit. And we'll talk in a minute about what is the path to victory and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth, desireth against the spirit. And we'll describe the battle plan. We'll describe how the battle goes. And you're going to be sitting here shaking your head because if you're a believer, you're experiencing this. Probably on a daily basis. But the first opponent, if you want to call it that, is our flesh. That, right? Right? portion of us that has not been changed, right, that is still with us, that is in opposition to God, to his will. It's that part of us that is truly full of iniquity. What is iniquity? Iniquity is the attitude, the will, right, not desiring the things of God. It's the attitude towards sin, either uh, for sin or against good. I don't know about you, it's a battle. This flesh is ever with me. Let's go to, go, to, go to Romans chapter 7. I told you we'd be bouncing back and forth. Paul expands on this idea as he describes the flesh. Romans 7. <laughs> All right. Let's look at verse number... Um, verse number 18. Paul's describing how there's this conflict in verse 18. He says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh. What's he say? Dwelleth no good thing. (laughs) Well, certainly there's some good there. No, Paul's like, there's nothing good. It's entirely opposed to God. God is the author of good. And it has once nothing to do with God. It defines its own brand of good. And it's not good. He says, there's no good thing, and dwelleth no good thing, for to will, and we'll talk about that here in a minute, how God changes our, 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 our desires, but for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Verse, we'll go verse 20. Now if I do that what I would not, it is no more I that do it, but what? Sin that dwelleth in me. What is that? That's my flesh. It's that sin nature. Right? That, that, that part of me that is in opposition to the things of God. All right, so who's the second part of this fight? Help me out. Who is it? We have the flesh and we have the spirit. Spirit. Right? You can think of self as your flesh, right? You can think of the spirit. Now let's go back to Galatians chapter 5. He says what? Walk in the spirit. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit. Seven times in chapter 5. This, the Spirit of God is, is referred to, right? Galatians chapter 5, he says what? For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, capital S, and the Spirit against the flesh, right? Now look at verse 18. But if you be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. There's this struggle. The word Spirit is simply the word pneuma. Pneuma is, is a Greek word that uh, in, in general literature just means this. It means air. Wind or breath. I find it interesting that that Paul, right, takes that word and uses it, right, to describe the Spirit of God. I don't think that's a mistake because I think when you think of how the Spirit works, he behaves like the wind. And that you cannot see him, but you can certainly see his effect on a person. Isn't that what Jesus said to Nicodemus? (laughs) That the Spirit of God works and moves to accomplish the purpose and will of God. But I can't see him. But I see his effect, just like the wind. He is like the air in that he gives us spiritual oxygen. 
He gives us spiritual life living in a broken world. He is like (laughs) the breath in that just as God breathed life into Adam, the Spirit of God breathes life into everyone who believes the gospel and he awakens us to true life, life in God. I'm here to tell you, if you are born again, you have been given the Spirit of God. He lives and dwells in you. We could go to the book of Ephesians and we could understand there that he is the earnest of our inheritance, that he has been given to us. And that if you're born again today, one of the, one of the marks of being a believer is that you possess the Spirit of God. Go to Romans chapter 8. Hope you're keeping your, at least your ribbon or finger there, all right? Look at chapter 8. Verse 14. For as many as are led, and we'll talk about what this leading is, led by the Spirit of God, they are the what? Sons of God. The children of God. The inheritors of God. Those that are led by the Spirit of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage. What brings us into bondage? Well, trying to keep the law to find God's favor or living according to our flesh. Both will bring you into bondage. But we've not received a spirit of bondage. Of captivity, but rather we have received what? Again, to fear, but ye have received the spirit, capital S, of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. There's a personal relationship, the spirit of God, right, communing with our spirit, causing us to cry out to understand that God is our Father. Verse 16 the spirit itself. One of, the, one of the, the tasks is, is he is bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Look at verse number 23. And not only they, right, speaking of creation, but ourselves also, which have the what? First fruits of the spirit. We groan waiting for the adoption, the redemption. Oh, what a day that will be. The hope of righteousness, as we see in chapter 5, verse number 5. The Spirit, right, also, verse 26, helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. If you want a blessed study, study the work and role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. And ask God to awaken your senses, awaken your understanding to exactly what he has given the Holy Spirit to do and what he is doing in your life. Jesus said to the the disciples, he says, uh, right in John 14, he's he's trying to comfort them. And he says, "Uh, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send you a what? Another comforter. And so there's two, one on either side of this great battle, the flesh that which is opposed to God, that, right, <laughs> sin nature, that part that someday will be regenerated, someday will be made new. What is still with us today? And then we have the Spirit of God within us, placed in us through salvation by the work of God. But what does this battle look like? Let's think about the battle. Number one, this battle is this. The flesh lusts. It's lust, it's desires, conflict with our renewed mind. What happened when you got saved? You were changed. Paul describes it this way, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creature. You changed. You changed. God changed you. He gave you his spirit. He changed your mind, how you think. talk about it in Romans chapter 12 that the renewing of our mind and it's a constant process God renewing our mind changing our thinking aligning it with his will with his word and with this new mind he gave us a new desire a desire to serve him and a desire motivated not because I want to find his acceptance but motivated out of love love for him the great motivator for the believer that I recognize and I understand and I've embraced fully the gospel of Jesus Christ and just how much God loves me. You know what that produces? You know what that engenders, what that generates? Love and response. 
You can go to 1 John chapter 4 and you can consider, right, this love that we experience, that we know because we are saved, but yet this flesh, its desires, it conflicts with the changed mind of the saved. Let's go to verse number 17. Uh, this is back in our text, Galatians 5. Look at verse 17. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. That ye would. What are the things that I would? The new desires, the new, right, that I want to pursue God. I want to do his will. I want to be, live in obedience to him. I love him so. Paul describes it this way. Go to Romans chapter 7. Look at verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Paul's describing, right, this renewed, regenerated mind that I've been given by the Spirit of God who indwells me. He's given me new desires. He's given me a new, right, want to. Yet this flesh is in constant opposition to it. Verse number uh, uh, eight, or excuse me, verse number 16. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Right? Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. We are read verse 18. Look at verse 19. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, but I delight in the law of God after the inward man. What is the law of God in the inward man? The Spirit of God placed in our hearts. He describes it in chapter 5, verse number uh, 14. The law is summed up in one word. Thou shalt love thy what? Neighbor as thyself. Yet there's this battle God has renewed our minds. He has brought us into the family. He has made us one of our, his children. He has changed the very basic desires of our hearts. Now we want to serve him. We don't want to live for him. But man, it's a struggle. You with me? If, if you're born again and you don't recognize there's a struggle, my friend, I, I, I fear that you may have already resigned and given up. And wave the white flag to your flesh and said, I'm not fighting anymore. I don't know. Every day is a battle for me. Even this morning. What a fight. What a battle just to get up, just to go, just to be what I need to be, just to spend time in the Word and pray. I mean, I'm telling you. It was like, well, you know, look at this on your phone. Hey, wonder what's going on on Facebook. That's my flesh. The Spirit of God saying, hey, what about me? I, I'll get to you in a minute. Okay, right? I mean, I'm that way. And this is just battle. And in my heart, I want to. I wake up wanting to read the Bible, and yet I find myself struggling. Right? Wanting to do the things I, I'd rather not do. In chapter 7. Uh, go, to, go back to chapter 7. Of Romans, look at verse 22 and 23. I know we're bouncing, and I'm, I'm sorry to do that to you, but I, I, I think you have to see both. He says, but I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Look at verse 23. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my what? Mind. The believer has a changed mind, a renewed mind. They are a new creature in Christ, and it is made possible by the Spirit of God. And so there's a war, Right? This lust in my flesh wars against the law of my mind, what's in my mind, what's been changed, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Who? How will I ever escape this struggle? How will I ever find victory in this war? We know this, that if the flesh wins, we read that in chapter 23, or chapter 7, verse 23, it will bring us back into bondage. And so many believers, including myself, 
at ter- certain points in my life have been brought into captivity under sin again because I allowed it. Right? Some of you sitting here today have found yourself back, right, becoming drunken again and brought under what? The captivity of that alcohol. Some of you here today have found yourself, right, dabbling with drugs and different things and then brought under captivity of that. Some of you today, right, have dabbled with pornography and lust and have been brought back into what? Captivity. And it's, it is very much captivity, is it not? Come on. Y'all looking at me like, not me, not me. I don't believe you. And I could, right? Some of you are in captivity to social media. This acceptance that you're trying to seek through social media. How many people like my stuff? How many comment on my stuff? Rather than acceptance with God. Some of you teenagers are being brought into the fleshly idea, right? And you're being brought into captivity, right? Of seeking the approval of your peers rather than pursuing a relationship with God and knowing and resting in his approval of your life. It's captivity, isn't it? Because if you're brought, allow yourself to be brought under that law of sin, what takes place? You're constantly thinking, what are they thinking? Are we friends? Are we good? Are we, right? Are they mad at me? Isn't that, wouldn't you want to be free from that? I don't need to worry about that. And I could give you illustration after illustration, and we'll talk next week about what the flesh produces. But it brings us into captivity. So the battle is won between the flesh and the spirit. If the flesh wins, it seeks, and at times brings us back into bondage and captivity. But thanks be to God, as a believer, you know what? He lives to set me free. I don't have to remain in bondage or captivity. If in yielding to the Spirit, right, and in every decision, if the Spirit wins, I walk in victory. I glorify God. There's nothing more blessed and more sweet when God gives you the grace to yield to your Spirit, to the Spirit of God, and not yield to your flesh, and you're able to actually be victorious. Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful thing? Man, I love that. There's nothing more discouraging. I think that's one of the things Satan uses to fail. And that's where we have to appropriate 1 John 1, 9. We have to embrace his blessed truth and blessed promise that if we will confess, if we will acknowledge our sin, it's already forgiven, by the way. If you're saved, your sins, past, present, and future are forgiven. But all he asks us to do is acknowledge them, confess them. And what does the Bible say? He is faithful, faithful, and just to what? Forgive us. Forgiveness is there. We can be reconciled and cleansed. We can be restored. Back into fellowship with God. Don't let the devil, hey, don't let the devil lie to you. Don't let the devil take your failures and hold them over you like some sort of, right, blackmail saying, you know what, God would never accept you. Look how, fail, look how big you failed him. If you're born again today, you know what you need to do? You need to take them to the very foot of the cross. And you say, you know what, Jesus, you've said that if I'll confess them, you'll forgive them and you'll restore me. Here they are. And then believe it. Believe it. And live in that truth. See, it's a fight. It's a battle. In every decision, in every temptation, there's a winner. flesh or the spirit but there the battle is going to be over someday look at chapter 5 go back to our text Galatians 5 look at verse 5 for we through the spirit do you see it there Galatians 5 5 but we through the spirit wait wait for what the hope of righteousness by faith. What is that hope of righteousness? He's coming back. <laughs> He's coming back. And what a day that will be. I'm telling you, that's why you ought to be expectantly looking for his return. Lord, the battle is raging. It's hard. Can you come back today? We look for it. We anticipate it. And with confident expectation, that's what hope is. It's assured. He's returning. 
And when he returns, we will see him as he is, and we will be made like him. And that's the Christian's great hope. You say, why doesn't he just come back now? I'm tired of fighting, Pastor. I'm going to address that here in a minute. Why doesn't he? You say, well, Pastor, boy, I'd rather it just not be a fight. Maybe you've said that to yourself or to others. It would be better if we didn't have a flesh. Well, let me give you two things to think about. Number one, don't be discouraged by the battle. Why? Number one, because it is better than we once were. You know, before you became a believer, guess what? You were dead in trespasses and sins. Sin had its way with you, and you were unable to stop it. You remember those days? Some of you? Right? You were, I like that dead in sins in Ephesians chapter 2. It's, to me, it's the picture of a boat just being tossed about by the waves, not having a rudder, not having oars, not having a motor, not having a sail, but just simply at the mercy of the sea. And a sinner without Christ is at the mercy of their flesh. This world, the devil, just pushed about, cast about. That's why when you see somebody lost and their life is a wreck and a ruin, and I'm telling you, this world is lying to people over and over again. Listen, the reason you're having problems, the reason there are emotional distresses in your life, the way to heal your hurts is to go and to really just go off the deep end. And it makes it worse for them. It makes it worse for them. Man, heart breaks for these folks. Don't get angry. Be angry at the liars. Be angry at the people deceiving be angry at the devil, this world. But love with compassion. Look at these dear folks. Our, our schools are sadly churning out young people who think, you know what, my issue is that I don't, my sexuality or my gender or my, my heart breaks for them. Our heart ought to break for them. And that's what we once were before we were saved. Man, it's better than what it was, wasn't it? But not only that, my friends, this battle, it's evidence of Christian life. <laughs> it's the evidence of a Christian experience taking place. That's why we're told to suit up, put on the armor of God. It's a battle. It's a fight. And my friends, we are overcomers. Right? He did, over and over again, he talks about that idea of overcoming in the book of Revelation, right? There's a promise to the overcomer. You know why? I said this earlier. Why are we overcomers? Because he's the overcomer. Let's go back to, if you're not there, Romans 7. What does Paul say? He, he, he cries out, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? From this sinful body, I'm such a wretched man. And he gives the answer, doesn't he? The answer is in verse 25. I thank God. How's delivery? How's victory? How's overcoming found? Through who? Jesus Christ our Lord. He won the victory. And you and I, if we're saved today, we're overcomers because he is overcome. So then with the mind, I myself are so the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Going back to the idea that Satan wants to have us live in this perpetual state of condemnation. Look at what he says in chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now what? <laughs> Man, embrace the truth. I, I don't know, you ever get mad at the devil? At your flesh. God, shut up. Right? <laughs> well, you're a loser. You're a liar. I don't know. This is maybe just weird internal dialogue I have. You don't have them. I do. And then it's these verses. Jesus says there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm his, devil. So how do we win the battle? Well, it begins by, by grace. It's by acknowledging 
it requires grace. It's God. It's entirely God. God enabling us. God empowering us. Right? Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says he besought the Lord three times to remove whatever weakness was in his flesh, right? This thorn in the flesh. And what was God's response? My grace is what? Sufficient for thee. For my strength, he says, God says, my strength is made perfect or complete in your weakness. You are able to see the completeness of the strength of God when we acknowledge and recognize our weakness and we present it to him. We live in an age and in a culture which weakness is despised. Weakness is mocked. And yet for the believer, we must have the spirit as John the Baptist had. He must increase and I must decrease. As James proclaims, God resisteth the proud but giveth grace to the what? Humble. It's by grace. It's humbling ourselves and recognizing I don't possess the strength. I don't possess the ability. It has to be God that enables this. It has to be God to show me his grace. But in our text, going back, and I believe this is the last time I'll have you flip. Go to Galatians chapter 5. That's not true. We're going to go one more time to Romans chapter 8. All right. At least I'm being honest with you, okay? I forgot I had one more reference in here. Look what he says. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. This is verse number 16. Walk in the Spirit. Let's talk a little bit about walking. To walk indicates a long step-by-step journey. It's a very procedural word. It isn't fast or slow, but walking rather is steady and constant. And I'm telling you, when he says walk in the Spirit, it's the idea that, uh, of our need to submit to the Spirit and life in the Spirit every day. It's not as much about individual choices as it is about a life lived in the Spirit. Walked, walking in the Spirit. It's taking each day each moment of each day, not worrying about tomorrow or the next week or what's going to happen, how spiritual am I going to be in a year. No, God, I need you today. It's waking up each moment and, 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 and engaging your mind with this thought. I need God today. The fight is on. Isn't that what the song says? The fight is on, oh Christian soldier. The fight is on. I wake up fighting my flesh. Do you not? I go to bed fighting my flesh. It is a constant battle. And he calls on me and you to walk. To take each step through each day in his spirit. Cognizant. Recognizing. Not not just drifting along. But truly, truly, right, aware, I need him. I need to be listening to him. You say, what, is that, what does that look like? Um, I've heard it described this way, and, and I'm just trying to help in this idea that it is really having the right focus. The source of victory and freedom in our Christian life comes when we focus on nurturing our spiritual life. It's interesting, Paul doesn't tell us to stop it. There's a silly skit. I don't even know who the actor is, but someone showed it to me. And someone comes in for counsel. You've probably seen it, right? Uh, doctor, I need to stop this. Or, you know, I need some help changing this in my life. And, and you know, have you ever seen the skit? And his re- he says, I, I, it's going to be easy. We'll be done in five minutes. You ready? Stop it. But doctor, doctor, and she goes on and on and on. And, and he's like, hmm, let me think about that. Ready? Stop it. Now, notice what Paul doesn't say to us to try do. He doesn't say stop it. Does he? He says what? Walk in the spirit. Right? It's, it's not the negative. Stop sinning. No, it's what? Obey the Spirit. Right? You say, well, it's just two sides of the same coin. Maybe it is, but 
But I, I think it's interesting that Paul is telling us to what? Yield, walk in Him. Yield to Him. Now, it's not that we don't focus on maybe fleshly attitudes or habits that we've found. And it's not that we don't try to, to cut off the things that feed them. But you're not going to be successful without the Spirit's power. It's got to be a mind, right? A, a minding the things of the Spirit. Uh, Romans 8.13, that is, it says, if, 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 if by the Spirit you could put to death the things of the flesh. It's by the Spirit. It's with His help. And there has to be an aggressiveness. In Colossians 3, you don't need to turn there if you want to write it down to look it up later. He says this in verse 5, it's the idea of mortify. Put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. That's a pretty aggressive language there. Put it to death. Kill it. But the promise here in Galatians is this. When we focus on life in the spirit, life according to the new nature God has given us, we will win. Walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. Victory assured. Victory comes. So let's think about what does it mean to walk in the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit. If this is the key to victory, we must know what it is. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But do you really know what it means to walk in the Spirit? I wonder why we're failing. Because we don't even understand what to do. Right? It'd be like sending some guys out and say, okay, we're going to go fight the enemy. Here's a gun. And the guy's never shot a gun, never loaded a gun. You know, he's looking down the, the pointy end. That's what all Marines do when they first get to boot camp. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, my Marine's not here. Anyway, all right. You'd let them know I said that, all right? That, the whole eight weeks of boot camp is just teaching them which end goes out the other way, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. So, any other Marines here? Oh, man, I'm sorry. Oh, man, I got another Marine. Now y'all are going to gang up on me. All right, Bill, Bill, I forgot you're a Marine, yes. Right? <laughs> I love teasing our Marines, right? We won't even go to the Air Force, some of you. I mean, Ms. Elizabeth's looking at me, she's giving me daggers. All right. But here's the idea. If we're going to be victorious, we have to understand what it is to walk in the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit. And so let's go back to the word that God, that Paul, and under the inspiration of God, is used for the Spirit here. What is the word? Numa. What is Numa? Outside of this context, what does it mean? Air, breath, wind. Okay? How does divine power mix with our responsibility? And some of you have been asking me, right? I've been teaching, we don't need to follow the law. Well, what do we do? How does this fit together? You know, <clears throat> We live near the, the sound, right? Have you ever gone and watched a sailboat? By the way, I saw a, somebody literally in our neighborhood has a, a coal-powered uh, yacht. I'm like, my kids are like, Dad, that thing has a smokestack. And I'm like, no. And in my mind, I'm like, I'm looking, I'm like, well, maybe it's a sailboat where they can, like, break the sail down and it looks like. No, literally, it was a smokestack. So I'm not talking about those kinds of boats. I'm talking about a sailboat. How many have ever been on a sailboat? All right. How many have been on a sailboat without a motor? Okay. Now, if you're going to go anywhere in a sailboat without a motor or oars, you must have what? Well, air. We all need air. We're going to die. But more specifically, wind. Thank you. All right. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm being silly. All right. You got to have wind. And does it do any good, though, if you have a beautiful wind and the sails aren't up? you got to have the sails up, right? You've got to have those sails set. The sailboat is not powered by the human energy, but by the wind. So think of it this way. In like manner, there are actions we can do, often on a regular basis, that set the sails for the Spirit of God to bring us along, to drive us along on this new life that He has designed for us. How many have ever struggled with your flesh? All right, good. All right, amen. All right, we're all being honest. You ever heard someone say to you, well, you just need to read your Bible, pray, and go to church? You do need to do those things. 
Because where, where is the Spirit of God going to teach us? Now, does, there, there are certainly people that say that you have to do it because that's the legalistic way, right? You've got to find favor with God by reading your Bible, praying. That's not what I'm saying. But how is the Spirit of God going to instruct me? It's right here. How am I going to make my needs known to God? How am I going to express to God that I recognize my great need? It's in prayer. Where am I going to find the encouragement to bring it all together? It's with God's people. Not as a means of achieving some level of spirituality, but my friends, you know what? I need to give the Spirit of God a surface time for Him to work. For Him to have a part of my life. I need to set those sails. Can they be done legalistically to earn God's favor? Yes, but I'm telling you, is not the word of God and prayer and time with God's people, is that not a place where the spirit of God can work? I've heard it said this, I, I like it. Even if you're away from the Lord, don't get out of church. I think there's some truth to that. Why? Because, man, under good, sound Bible preaching, God can begin to work. If you're born again, and even if you're not, God can begin to work. When engaged in the right spirit with the right heart, Bible reading, prayer, the word of God, the time spent with his people, assembling, it, it does, it beats back the flesh. Maybe you have, here, just give you some examples, maybe you're, you struggle with social media. So maybe there's a, a moment you say, you know, Lord, I'm going to commit to you because I, I do want you to have first place in my life. I, I do want victory over these things. You know, before I pick up my phone, maybe I'm going to get an app that shuts it down until a certain time. And I'm going to give my husband or my wife the key. Because, Lord, I want to, I want to make space here. I want to create opportunity for your spirit to work in my heart so that, you know what, I'm not tempted. I didn't have my phone up here. I'm not tempted to pick it up and look at it. Amen? Hey, maybe you're a man struggling with lust, and in your hand you hold this phone that has every type of pornography imaginable. You're fooling yourself if you think you're going to get victory by having that thing in your hand unprotected. I don't, right? It's putting to death, it's being serious, it's mortifying, and saying, Holy Spirit of God, I want you to work. It's, it's minding the things of the Spirit. Maybe you're addicted to news. You know who you are. Like the Fox News. I don't even know if that's a thing anymore. If people watch that anymore. Fox News, like it's burned into the screen of your television. And you're just engaged and your mind is constantly, right? Maybe it's one of these things where you say, you know what? I'm limiting myself to an hour a day or two hours a day because I need to give the spirit of God. I need there to be quiet so he can work. I'm just giving ideas. These are not, this is my opinion. But, but, but I want you to pray, Lord, is there something that I can do so that your spirit has space and time and a surface upon which to blow? Do, do you see what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? Maybe you're a teenager and you've got a video game addiction. Maybe it's to make a plan to say, you know what? I'm going to limit it to this much time. Maybe it's uh, uh, coming and, and committing and being accountable to maybe some Christian friends or, or your parents or leadership. Maybe, maybe you decide, you know what, I'm going to end each day. Instead of ending the day falling asleep to video games, I'm going to end each day and I'm going to read a, a psalm. Because I want the Spirit of God. I want Him to end my day. I want Him to be a... Do you, do you see the point? Not in a legalistic way. That doesn't make you more spiritual. You recognize this, right? But more, God, I recognize that my flesh is so powerful and I don't want it to win. I want to be victorious and victor victory is assured through Jesus Christ. And, and in Romans chapter 8, this, this is the last place I was going to take you. So go back to Romans. There you go, sorry. Look at verse number 5. For they that are after the flesh... Do mind. Do you ever heard someone say, mind your manners? What does that mean? 
pay attention to your what? Your manners, how you're treating people, how you're acting, pay attention to it. So I think it's similar usage here in chapter, chapter 8, verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do what? Mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit do mind the things of the Spirit. For the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. Verse, verse number 7, neither indeed can be. What we need is we say, Lord, I want the Spirit of God to have the space, the time to be able to work and to move in my life. I, I, I've told you this example in my own life. I, I found that if I watch too much television, I, 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 I find myself growing cold to the things of God. I find myself struggling more and more with lust. This is just myself personally. You say, are you preaching against television? I'm not up here preaching against television. You need to make a decision whether or not you have it in your home, whether or not you have it in your life. But I know this for myself. If I watch more than just a little bit every week, guess what, what I'm struggling with? I'm struggling with lust. I'm struggling with a coldness toward the things of God. And so guess what? I'd rather have God. And there are days, there are weeks I fail. There are, man, I'm telling you, there's times, man, you find a good series and you're like, I can't stop watching but then at the end of it, I'm like, man, Lord, I'm right. I knew this was not a good idea. And so guess what I've had to do? I've had to just really limit. Ask my wife. We, we, we barely watch it anymore. Not that we won't. Not that we can't. Not that we be sin. But do you see the point? It's walking and then being led by the Spirit. Right? Seeking his leadership, seeking to be under his guidance, his control, and really beginning your day with that prayer. Lord, I want your direction. I want your guidance in my life. I don't want to yield to my flesh. I don't want it to win. I want to live in victory. You think about Samson. Samson was uniquely empowered by God's Spirit. He was set apart by God at birth. He became a great and heroic deliverer of God's people. But for as strong as the Spirit was in Samson's life, he always battled the desires of his flesh. And how did it culminate for him? It culminated for him with his head in the lap of a woman by the name of Delilah. You know, Samson always found himself down there with the Philistine women. Goofing around down there with the Philistines, right? Playing games with them. Looking, being in a place where, guess where, he's going he's gonna to see some Philistine women. The women he shouldn't be with. Yet, where's he at? It's like the little boy. You've heard me give this illustration, right? Mama comes into the, the kitchen, his hand's in the cookie jar. She's like, Johnny, I told you, no cookies. He says, Mama, I'm fighting temptation. You know, so many times our hands are in the cookie jar and we wonder why we're failing. We're turning on that television channel, right? We're, we're opening up that browser, that phone, without any filter or accountability. Amen. And we say, Lord, why am I failing? You know what? We've got to put it to death. We've got to give the Spirit of God a space and an opportunity and a surface upon which to blow into our lives and to work. And so we find Samson vexed putting himself in harm's way time and time again. And rather than flee so he could be obedient to God, he stayed in those environments. He stayed with those companions that hindered his progress and ultimately literally enslaved him. But I'm here to tell you, there's another better than Samson who has arrived. Jesus tempted at all points like as we are yet without sin. Alone in the wilderness, 40 days without any food, enduring the most brutal assaults of the enemy. Yet not one time did he fail. <laughs> Alone on the cross. Having been abandoned by the ones closest to him. Not one time did he flinch. Not one time was he selfish. But submitted himself to the will of the Father. Our example. And he rose from the dead. Oh, he brought with him a newness of life for all who believe in him. 
And the Spirit of God births us into that new nature. It sets us free. We don't have to follow our sinful nature anymore. We don't have to follow the flesh anymore. We can be obedient to God and fulfill the righteous requirements of the law in yielding to His Spirit. And we can shine as lights, blameless without reproach, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. That's what you and I get to do if we're saved. Oh, God, help us. Help us to be what you've called us to be. Help us to walk in your spirit, be led by your spirit. Understanding I'm free from the law, that it is obedience to the direction and leading of your spirit and the victory that he brings. Help me to pursue, to feed upon, to walk in and to be led by the spirit. May he reform me. May he guide me. May he help me look more like Jesus than my selfish desires. But you know what? It's not an automatic process. Paul calls on and says, you need to work out your salvation. You need to work. Recognize there's a a process that I'm involved in. As I submit myself more and more to the Spirit of God, he transforms me more and more into the image of Christ. I'm here to tell you, friend, my friend, there is victory. There is victory. Because of Jesus Christ. He's the overcomer, and he makes us overcomers. You say, well, pastor, I've really been failing. You don't even know. God does. And he's ready to forgive you. He says, just come to me, acknowledge it, confess it. I'll forgive you. I'll cleanse you. I'll bring you back into fellowship with me. And you know what? We can start again. I'll set you free from the bondage. God, give us the grace to yield to the Holy Spirit of God. To learn to walk in the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, to mind the things of the Spirit. To see the victory God intends for us and His plan for us. With heads bowed and eyes closed.